with mine blank. Episode 93. Episode 93, finally 93. getting around to doing one again. Yeah, yeah 7 to 100. Um, welcome, Paul Ratchgarden. Guys. Uh, um, coach at Elgin Boxing Club. Um, how are you? I'm good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good, thank you. First podcast. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nervous? Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose uh, you're kind of used to it though, like the whole BBC stuff and that as well. well I was nervous for that as well. To be yeah. honest, you know what I mean? uh, it's one of those, as you said about Martin, it's like standing in front of a class and talking because that's your comfort zone, isn't it? But mm-hmm. things like this is slightly out of it. It's, it's strange how you can be comfortable speaking to 30 people, but when it's just two people, it's a bit yeah. different, isn't it? It's a bit more intimate, but it's, um, it's good. It's good. Um, we've been trying, we've been speaking for a while about getting Ratch on. Um, we've had a few of your guys for the club on. The everyone we've had on that knows you spoke very highly of you. Um, so we've been kind of keen to get you on since Smarty. Um, Smarty was the first person we had on yeah. who who spoke about you. We've also had Fraser on. Um, as I say, they they both says um, like a like a sec- second dad to them. Yeah. Um, how did you come? I'm, I'm going to go a, a bit back to before we go to Elgin. How did you yeah. come to associate yourself with boxing, Nutch? So, basically, this only took, what, one minute before I mentioned I was in the RAF. <laughs> <laughs> it, all, everybody takes the mic out to me because I mentioned that I was in the RAF. So, I was in the RAF. I'd done training, boxing training, down at Peterborough and a few places. Never competed. I got to Germany and I thought, right, I'll get back into it. And at the time, I was doing a lot of running. So I went to the club there and the coach there, Mick Humphreys, he was a mountain of a man. I walked in, I said, right, I want to come do some training, but I'm not about that competing. He went, well, yeah, the fight, oh, you yeah, F off. <laughs> and that's how it came about. So basically, <laughs> it was kind of like, do that or not. So I started training with him, uh, did the RAF Championships the first year, come away with silver, miffed off with that. A few more bouts in between, went back. Uh, boxed the darling of the raft, this guy that thought I was going to go on and do all this, and uh, I beat him uh, to everybody's disappointment. Uh, so, <laughs> on the party. <laughs> exactly, yeah, really ruined the party. So, from that, uh, I then did the you go to uh, the Combined Services Championships, which I did terrible at, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I was known as a haemophilia boxer because every time I got punched, I bled. Uh, so, a few of my fights got stuck because of bleeding, uh, and then. My last one was when I came to, I was posted to Kinloss. Uh, and then after that, oh, Megan was born. And I was like, time to look at coaching. I'd already done the coaching level one with the RAF. Uh, so I just migrated into that side of things. Yeah. Were you a successful amateur, Raj? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> 50-50, let's put that. Yeah. 10 bolts, won five, lost five. So I can't say, I said, my claim to fame was I did a, a boxing show in Germany and I was the only one from the camp that that won. Yeah, so yeah. that was my five minutes of fame when I was over there. Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I mean, I suppose there's kind of two ways to look at this, but like as a fighter and now obviously as a coach, do you think you learn more from a loss? Then obviously everyone wants to win all exactly, the time, yeah. right? It's a, a competitive nature, but do you learn more about yourself or people that you've coached from losses rather than, you know, unbeaten records all the time and, and what have you? <laughs> I think it's, it's like people go about records, and this is a cliche, records are for DJs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's thrown all the way around. Um, when people have, like, we've got Scott Edwards, yeah, who boxed, lost his second fight, yeah, and then went on to win two Scottish championships. You know what I mean? If, and then we had other people that have gone all the way through yeah, to about seven, eight, nine, ten fights, then lost one, and they just get disheartened. You know what I mean? So it's, it all depends... Uh, I'll be throwing lots of names here, by the way, yeah? but it's like Aaron Devine, he's a, an RAF guy, started boxing for us, lost, 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 won, won, lost, 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 won, 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 lost, won, lost, won, won, and it starts to creep up more and more and more. And it's that mental strength you have, because people who've never lost, when it does happen, and it's, it's, so, yeah. it's so destroying. I'm not really, I mean, I've been there, I've seen the losses, and I've been with the guys when they've lost. Yeah, you know I mean, you're going, oh, God. And some of it, the thing with boxing is, it's subjective. You've got either three or five judges watching it, and some like something, some like others. Some of them are like 80 odd, and they wake up when the final bell rings and they go, Oh, he's won. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's so for some of them, I mean, they've had really close split decisions. So there's nothing worse when you hear a split decision and you're looking, going, Oh, God. And it goes 3 2 to the other person. Yeah. yeah. 
And especially when it's young kids and they go back and the mates are like, oh, did you win? No, I lost on a split. Oh, you lost. That's all they hear. Yeah. You know yep. I mean? So going back to it, I think for some people, a loss is a good thing. Yeah. And for others, it haunts them and haunts them. And then it kind of like crumbles the self-confidence a bit. But we don't put pressure on wins. We can enjoy it. Yeah. Do the work. Give 100%. Yeah. And then we'll get there eventually. How did you get involved with Elgin Boxing Club? So you'd moved obviously over here with the RAF. Um, I actually yeah. remember from the the little thing that the BBC done on you that you said that someone had came and approached you whilst you were working in the RAF and said that they were looking for someone to come and help them out and whatnot. So how yeah. did that kind of play out? It was a guy, I think his name was Paul McKenzie. He was working on the RAF base and uh, he was training for a fight. And at the time, Elgin had never actually had a club. Yeah. Donald Campbell, who's our OIC, our official, he was running out. I think he was just training wherever he could find places to train. Uh, and Paul said to me, I was, he was coming to the RAF camp. We were training, and then I went and did one of his corners for him, I think. And he said, can you help? But at the time, I was doing college, new job with the RAF base, uh, coaching there. So my, it was pretty full. You know what I mean? The schedule was pretty full. New family, you know, quite young family as well. Uh, so I was like, oh, I don't know. He's like, well, can you just do one day? So I was like, okay, then. So basically, I got a message from him. He said, right, tomorrow training. I'm like, no, tomorrow's Tuesday. Mate. We train Monday and Wednesdays. He said, no, no, you said you can help at the club. So I was trying to make all the excuses you do. You know I mean, you're trying to figure out ways to get away with it. And he's like, oh, you did say, and I told him you'd help. So I turned up, and as I turned up, there was Moira and Donald Campbell there, uh, Ian Goldie, who's now one of the coaches, and a few wee kids. And I turned up and went, right. And the etiquette normally is you go to a club and you go, I'm Ratch, blah, blah, blah. Who's your head coach? So I went, oh, Ratch, who's your head coach? And they went, you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. So I basically did the coaching for about a year and a bit. Then I got posted down to Lucas, and it, uh, down south, Dundee Way. I was there for about 10 months. In the meantime, Bradley Poole's dad, Matt, he yeah. done his coaching, uh, Goldie, he'd done his coaching as well. We also had Jason Grant and uh, Kev Jumpman doing it as well. And I came back and just continued like so. And that's oh, probably, about, probably about 18 years now. When you say, like, back at the start, there's a few kids that Matt, I've seen the photos that they put on the boxing clubs. He says that my mats are full mm. now. You know? Oh, it's, it, it's so busy. But we, I think we've got it right now because what we used to do <coughs> was... Uh, you say you want to join the the, uh, the the boxing club, Elgin Boxing Club, yeah, and you've been going for ten years. Yeah, your level and your level is two different things. Yeah, but you'd all be in the same class, so you'd be struggling like mad, and your level would be being brought down to match him. So at one point, we went, this isn't working at all. So what we started doing then was we had boxers only sessions. Yeah, uh, about three years ago, we brought in a beginners one, and then roughly only about. A month or two ago, we brought in an intermediate one. So what happens now is somebody turns around and says, I want to start boxing. If they're 13 and above, they go to the beginner's class. If they're younger than that, they go to the kid's class. And then once we start going, yeah, these are showing some potential, yeah, we'll then get them onto the intermediate one. Yeah, And then what we'll do is say once a week, come to the regular one, see how you fit in. Um, and then they just migrate onto that because for some people who are really good at beginners, they go in the... And then the training's hard, it's at another level, yeah, or the sparing gets hard and then they disappear. Yeah. So, but you said at the moment, well, on Thursday we had, what was it, 32 people in the actual boxers class. Wow. The beginners won, that was 25, the intermediates was 15, female only, that's busy, kids want, you know, so it's, yeah. and then they've got the Friday Night Club. I've got to mention them because if I don't, they start sulking. <laughs> Friday Night Club, which is basically, then guys go there, do the fitness side of things on a Friday. But it's quite hardcore. I've been to one or two myself, and you go, oof. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah right. it is, it's working well. Do you, um, just kind of looking at how there's different routes these days, let's just say, in the boxing. Mm -hmm. um, can you just say as a coach how important grassroots boxing is um, over other um, potential ways into boxing? How, how much more important? Because... There's a lot of kids who these days will look at YouTube boxers and think yeah. that that's the way to go and things like that. But you as a coach, can you explain how, how much more important that would be than trying to get famous and trying to call out names as such? It's, uh, yeah, call out the names <laughs> yeah. and squaring up to people and stuff like that. It's like 
the white collar. I understand they have this ultra white collar. You train for six weeks and then you go in the boxing ring. Now, for me, we've never put anybody, we, we won't put them in for a fight after six weeks. Yeah, mm -hmm. Six weeks, you just learn the basics. But I can understand why some people want to do that. They want to go, I've had a fight, I've been in the, well, it's the adrenaline or what. But we had, uh, I think one was a, an English white collar champion and one was such and such a champion. And they came to the boxing club about three or four years ago. And uh, I put him in with Corey Rizzo, who at the time was probably about 15. Yeah. And he battered them both. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't do it for, let's give these a battering because we were all about how great they were and stuff like that. So I thought, right, put you with somebody who's at a decent level. Yeah. Uh, and then we never see him again. Yeah. <laughs> so, but for some people, <laughs> I've seen some of these white collar things and it's it's more like exhaustion that stops the fight. Yeah. Yeah, because they've only trained for six weeks uh, uh, and they've not had the grounding, the defence. As soon as you get punched in the face a few times, it's tiring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you can see why. But going back to the grassroots, I agree totally with that. Uh, you stay at a club and you gradually build up, build up, build your confidence and then you have your first fight and nobody's... We got like a load of kids and we had our short Bishop Mill, uh, mm -hmm. which was a good success. Unfortunately, we had it on the hottest day of the year. Oh, it was horrible. <laughs> in the, even just in the corner, you were dying. Uh, but we had all them doing little exhibitions and skills. So it's good for the parents to see what they've done. And also breaks out nerves as well. Going into a ring for the first time and everybody's yeah. round you cheering. It's quite nerve wracking. Like yeah. So to answer your question, yeah, I think <sighs> all the... Jake Pauls and all this type of thing. And we've all watched it. It's, you know, it's not real. It's not real. Yeah, it's, it's not real. No, it's garbage. And I suppose there's like an element of like outside the ring of that as well. Like a lot of people just see this person like having these big shows and getting paid lots of money and that. Yeah. And it's, it's like, he's got a lot of money to start with, you know, like yeah. he can build like yeah. and fast track his way to like getting some of the best coaches around and, and some of the best equipment and nutritionists, all these sorts of things, right? Where that, resilience through the white collar model isn't just like given on the first week as it is built over time even the guys that are fighting at pro level for, uh, from the the club um smarty and fraser for example right have went through the amateurs and yeah. had losses and, and all this type, uh, type of thing as well when you became a head coach uh was that almost kind of like learning on the job in a way because although you'd done coaching and that for the raf and ever uh, everything like that I'd imagine there was like loads of different dynamics that being a head coach had to kind of take on from just being a coach within itself. Yeah, yeah there's, <clears throat> for me, uh, as I say, every day you learn in, in the club, yeah? Even if it's like one of the kids says, how do you do this? And you're thinking, well, I've not explained that cl clearly enough. Or, yeah, that's a good point and stuff like that. Uh, going from the head side of things, first of all, it's quite difficult because you're telling somebody else to do something, yeah? Uh, so you go, right, you take this bit, you take that bit, you take this bit, yeah. Uh, at the moment, we've got myself, Goldie, David Gregor, Helen, all coaching, and it works really well, yeah, and we all can bounce off each other and stuff like that. And even they'll come up with ideas and go, let's try this, let's try that, yeah. Uh, but if you go to some clubs, our club's quite strict and rigid, yeah, uh, and what we do, but every session, this may sound bizarre, but every session's different, so to try and get that twice a week, different sessions and stuff like that, it takes a lot of work. Like your fundamentals, you warm up and your punching mechanics are exactly the same. Yeah, but then the theme of what we do changes because I've been to clubs. You guys may have been to clubs where you go in there and it's the same old thing. You go in there, do your warm up, do some skipping, do a ton up, do your bag work, do your sparring, stretch off, go warm, and it's week in week out. And for me, I can't think of anything more boring. Yeah, yeah. but. Going back to the head coach side of things, I was also uh, coaching for the RAF. So once again, that was quite good because it'd be like, right, you take this session. So you turned up, there's boxes you don't know uh, and there's coaches you don't know. You have to, right, you do this, you do that, you do that, yeah. And then get their ideas as well. So it's, luckily, the RAF side of the coaching and the Elgin side kind of progressed at the same time. Yeah. So the ideas I was getting from that and vice versa, with Boxing Scotland, when they've been doing things with Boxing Scotland, uh, stole loads of ideas from them because <laughs> there's nothing new in boxing or any martial arts or sports. You know what I mean? You're just stealing my ideas and amalgamating them and coming up with your own ideas. Like, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's um, it's while we're on coaching, I've kind of started recently coaching the last six months myself with, with football. Dutch, what's the key to being a good coach? 
Uh, I heard a oh, soft phrase the other day, which is quite good. And it's like, a good coach doesn't tell you what you want to hear. It tells you what you need to hear. Yeah. Okay. And I thought that's quite relevant because there's some people who come to the club, yeah, and they're not listening and blah, blah, blah. So you went, mate, you need to, yeah. And some of them think they can just pop in once in a while. Uh, even today, I pinged the message out and I went, right, guys, boxing season started. Tomorrow, weigh yourself. We'll discuss what weights. If you're not at the club this week, that's you gone. And sometimes you have to be that brutal to give people that little kick up the backside. So they go, yeah, yeah I better pull my socks up. You know what I mean? Because it's easy making loads of excuses. We've all done it. I've done it in the past. You know what I mean? I can't be bothered and feeling tired or this type of thing. But once they go, nobody ever leaves going, I wish I had to come tonight. They all mm. leave going, I'm glad I forced myself to go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I want to talk a bit about uh, the success of the club over the years, and I mean, there's there's two different sides to this because obviously there's the success of I know your daughter's box, like the Commonwealth Games for yeah. Team Scotland, and uh, first of all, congratulations to you and Fraser for him becoming the first fighter out of Murray to hold a professional title. Yeah, um, you know, obviously an amazing event as well. It was local show, um, yeah. which doesn't happen very often in terms of the pros uh, up here and that. But I also want to kind of touch on other uh, things as well, and it was kind of mentioned in the the article uh, the videos rather that the BBC did of where you were talking about everyone being treated the same mm -hmm. now I don't want this to sound like a, a lazy question because I'm just generally interested to hear your thoughts on this but you you're of the kind of opinion of I want everyone to be treated the same I just want to ask why is that an important value to you as a coach and obviously the, the a, a value to the club as well the thing is if you go there and there's a click and you see somebody getting treated, like when I say treated the same, so if somebody's got a championship coming up, they are going to get more attention yeah. because they've got a championship coming up, like we had uh, Lucas and Marcus recently doing the uh, Golden Gloves down in uh, Motherwell. So they got a bit more pads with people, a bit more training, blah, blah. But everybody who walks in that club straight away is a member of the Elgin Boxing Club. It's as simple as that. So they'll get treated the same. There's a set of rules. Everybody's got to follow it. Yeah, and it may sound quite autocratic and military and stuff like that, but I mean, when the coaches are talking, you listen, not hitting the bags unless you get told to, not hitting each other, especially unless you get told <laughs> to. Yeah, so there's all these different rules, yeah, but it just sets that level playing field. So you're not getting the people coming in, oh, oh, I'm just going to do this tonight, I'm just going to do this training. I've seen it in other clubs, people going like, oh, I'm not going to train with these, I'm going to do my own thing. They don't cut the mustard. And for that, then everybody's on the same level, yeah, and it's and it's really good, like you know what I mean. So that's people could walk in, whether it's as I said the first time they moved up to the boxing class, yeah, they know they're gonna get treated exactly the same as the other person. Yeah, if they're late, they get press ups. I, I bish press press ups house all the time, as you can tell. Like if they're late, they get press ups. If they don't pay, which is a common thing, they get press ups. Yeah, <laughs> um, and you know what? It's the same price now that it was when I first started. We've never increased it. We try to keep it at that so yeah. everybody can go. Like there's a, a set of twins that come to the club. So imagine if we pumped it up to like five, six pound, that's twelve pound for them each week they pay it. I mean, so we can't try and keep the, the level down yeah. as much as we can. And that gets helped with sponsors and the shows we have and stuff like that to keep the club going, like you know what I mean. Have you ever seen any really talented boxers go to waste? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. Ginji turns on the dark side. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he went to MMA. <laughs> In fact, he was at the club the other day, and I said to him, he was the most naturally gifted with footwork. Yeah, yep. I'd seen. Uh, uh, and then he got in and got his face punched off at sparring. No, I'm yeah. joking. No, he did well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, th there's there's quite a few that it's kind of like throws you all of a sudden. They'll go, oh, I'm going to start playing football again. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'd lose lots of football. Like I mean. Yep. Uh, Luckily for where we are, there's not that many clubs around. If you go down to Glasgow or Edinburgh, Central Belt, anywhere like that, people go from club to club. You can't keep a track of which clubs there are. Yeah. Uh, so if they want to move from us, they either go towards Nern, Inverness, or towards Inch or Inverurie. So it's still quite a bit of a trek. So they're kind of forced in a way to stay with us yeah, until they get to a certain level. Yeah. Uh, and then they go... Now I realise why they're doing this. Now I realise why Goldie's saying this. So we had a, a lad who came from one of the clubs at Nern and they have a habit of hands down and doing this. 
And as soon as he walked in, he went like, go the other pad on and just cracked him around the face. <laughs> and he goes, get your hands up. And his hands have been up ever since. And now he's, you know, he's a Scottish champion. Yeah. <laughs> so he obviously did them a world of good. Like, yeah, uh, I just want to talk about some of the fighters. And you obviously mentioned uh, Scottish champion there. And we'll, we'll talk about Fraser in a, a little bit as well. But I wanted to talk about Smarty because I know he's obviously got a Scottish title fight coming up in a few That's weeks' right, time. Yeah. Um, we obviously spoke to him last year. And like one of the from following Smarty as well, I think one of the things that has to be said, he's had some absolute rotten luck with fights being rearranged and yeah. injuries and the yeah. pandemic happening um when it did. Uh and I know that he was in the Scottish title fight against Robbie Graham, which was very uh, kind of just got narrowly edged out by Robbie. Yeah. Um actually actually seeing them in an interview together, it was kind of amazing to me that they're in the same weight class because Robbie's a, like a very tall dude from yeah. I th- you know, looked a bit like six one, six two, something like that. Um Smarty said at the time when he, he came off the back of that loss that he was going to push for the immediate rematch mm-hmm. where he's now actually fighting for a vacant Scottish title against, is it Matt Croissant? He's a 7-0 uh, yeah, prospect. Yeah. And is it on the undercard of a Ricky Burns card yeah, as well? Because yeah, we, we were actually talking about him a few weeks ago and we thought he was retired, but I guess that yeah. that's not the case. <laughs> no, Ricky Burns is boxing Limond. Yeah. I've actually got tickets to go and watch it. Yeah, so, uh, But the normally if you see with the pros it, there's, they only have like four fights on sometimes I've been to before where it's like three fights yeah. now if we did an amateur show and only put three fights on people would be mugging me outside and demanding the money back and stuff like that yeah, yeah. but it's how it works <laughs> sometimes call offs sometimes they just feel that, that'll be enough because the, the main event can carry it yeah but on that one you know about now there's absolutely loads boxing on it Tyler Jolly uh, Ger, there's so it's going to be really good. Cassidy, she's on it as well. So there's lots of people when I was doing the Scotland side who were going through at that time. They've now turned pro, so I'd be quite interested to watch that, yeah. But for Smarty, you know about the height difference? He was boxing at the wrong weight, to be honest. Yeah. Um, he should have been boxing a lighter weight, but he chose it in the end of the day. He's a, he's a professional. He decides what weight he's going in at. You know what I mean? And that's the difference between the amateurs and the pros. Uh, and that's why I've moved away from the pro side now, is when it comes to the amateurs, you're a coach, I'm a coach, you find me and go, right, I've got this lad, 75 kilograms, yeah, you've got a lad, he's 76 kilograms, both nil bouters. I go, yeah, that sounds brilliant. So on we go, it doesn't work like that. What happens is the manager tells the boxer, yeah, this is who I've got lined up for you to box, yeah. He goes, yeah or no, and then the train is last in the yeah. chain. You know what I mean, so for me, there's a few times I was like, like Fraser's last one, I wasn't too happy with that, but he wanted to take it. Uh, Smarty with the waist, that was another thing, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's one of the reasons I've kind of moved away from that side. Uh, and also as well, I found out you can only spread yourself so thin, you know what I mean? Uh, so going back before, was about Lucas and Marcus. It was only the week before, I thought, holy crap, these guys are boxing in the, the Britishes. Yeah. Where four or five years ago, I'd been down there. Every, it's like when Andrew Smart boxed uh, uh, Josh Taylor. Yeah. yeah, I spent weeks and weeks on YouTube watching videos of Josh Taylor, analysing it, going down with Smarty, trying different things and stuff like that. Uh, like granted, it didn't work. <laughs> but uh, I put all that effort in. And it's the same with other people when Meg and Aaron were going doing the, uh, the Scottish Championships, loads of time with them. And it was only when I realised, I thought, these two kids are boxing British Championships and I've done no extra time with them. So that also sets play in my mind. I thought, I'm not being fair to everybody here. So that's why I went, you know what, move away from it. I may go back again, who knows, you know what I mean? But for the time being, I think it was the right choice. Yeah, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier on, um, successes in the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to speak about your daughter a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I said, I don't know if you know the ins and outs. Oh, Megan was pestering. She saw a lad who used to go to school with, uh, Jack Reed boxing at the Bishop Mill Hall. And she went, I want to do that. And I was like, no, no, I'm not having it. And it's not, I've got nothing as female boxing, yeah. We've got loads of them in the club now, yeah. They've even got their own corner called Bitches Corner, yeah. <laughs> like, there's not many of them, honestly. It's just, and they're all great girls. They really are absolutely nuts, but great girls. So at the time, uh, there was only one girl they ever boxed for us. That was a girl called Michelle. Uh, Meg was pestering. I was like, no. So I said, all right, then we'll train for two months. She said it was three, but it was actually two months. Two months yeah, and every day. And if you stick with that, I'll let you come to the club. So that's what we did. And 
uh, normally you use the positive reinforcements. That was really good. You did the really good. You did that, and it was all just negative because I basically just wanted to know how low you can sink in the sport, yeah, and your feelings and stuff like that. So. Me and my missus, we had so many fallouts with it. She's like, you can't talk to her like that and blah, blah. So eventually, credits to make she stuck at it. Uh, and then we got a, a, a first exhibition. Uh, and there's a girl from over at Auburn Way. And the coach there, right, real nice guy, a friend of mine, he's like, right, you've got a girl, I've got a girl. He goes, what's your Megan? At the time, Meg was still quite heavy. She was about 56 kilograms, 54 kilograms, something like that. And he's like, right, he goes, my girl's in the 60s, but it's only an exhibition. I was like, yeah, brilliant. And then as it gets any closer and closer, it's like she keeps on putting weight on. And then they, and this girl turned up, which was 75 kilograms, uh, and put in with Meg, and it was just like, <laughs> it was just wow. massive. She was, yeah, but Meg boxed her socks off. So yeah. for that, I think kudos to Meg, like, you know what I mean? And then obviously, she's getting more and more bouts. Uh, she then won, and the problem was, was there wasn't that many females doing it then. So every time we try to get her about, it get called off and stuff like that. So credit to her, she stuck with it. And, I mean, she did well. Youth Commonwealth Games medalist, Commonwealth Games, numerous Scottish championships uh, over in Ireland, won a few times. Got robbed a few times in Ireland as well. Uh, but that's by and by, like... You must be proud of her. Oh, I am, I am. Yeah. <coughs> now, uh, I could quit like this, two seconds. I'm not getting emotional, don't I? Seriously. <laughs> now... When they were in Aaron did the uh, the Scotches, uh, all about interviews before, yeah, as you can say, I'm not very good at interviews. Uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, right, Meg box well, don't get me wrong, right, but going into the GB's British Championships is in those level, yeah. So when I went for the interview uh, with the Boxing Scotland guys, and I went, oh, that's not the best at Meg's box, she can box a lot better than that. And my phone never stopped pinging, with that. you're so harsh and stuff like that. But I said, I was chuffed with her, really was. Um, fantastic yeah yeah, good uh, going on to Fraser obviously um, I actually seen the post last night of where he's now going to be uh, training out of Aberdeen and that right, kind yeah. of fits in line with what you were saying about moving away from the pro side I just want to talk about his last 10 months because he has had a bit of a roller coaster right from the, the highest highs to suffering his first pro loss um, you know we mentioned the Elgin show earlier was that a bit surreal for you seeing like people like Smarty and Fraser that you've known since they're like 10, 13 years old to then like fighting for these titles, especially with, the, with Fraser winning in Elgin and that. Is that just like a like a full circle moment, like knowing it, it, him for 10, 15 years? Yeah, it is. It's it's anyway, it's good to see because Fraser actually moved away for a bit. He went to Marines, uh, yeah. for, for, well, before they went uh, playing football. So he was one that, uh, it was, he was another one that was unlucky. I mean, he split decision, split decision against him, split decision. Uh, him and Meg, see, if you watch some of the rounds that they used to spare when obviously they're the same age and weight, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, they paid to watch it, yeah. Uh, he then moved away from football, came back again, uh, and he was, once again, unlucky on certain decisions. He went down to Scotches. Uh, I thought he'd won. He lost on a split again. Yeah, I mean, that type of thing. But uh, the one in Elgin, that was, well, it was somewhere else. It was really good. It was a home crowd, yeah, really Really enjoyable Big to atmosphere. see, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on the flip side, when he obviously lost it, yeah. Uh, as I said, that's a, another that was going through my mind as well. There's things I wish I'd done different on the build up to that. Uh, but me and my missus uh, was going on holiday the day afterwards. Yeah. Uh, it's like my hobby's boxing, hers is booking holidays. <laughs> right? So we're on a holiday the day afterwards, uh, and I'd say for at least first two days it was just going round and round in my mind I should have done this I should have done that at one point I thought I should have said to him and, and he'll when you get him in he'll say the same he's able to the right space for that yeah but also no disrespect to Corey he, he came in his first one I was expecting more from him the second one the what I was expecting he brought to yeah. the game yeah you know I mean I mean, for, for anyone that hasn't seen the fight, it's actually on YouTube. And yeah. if you're a neutral spectator, it's probably one of the best fights that we've seen in the country. It's yeah. just so high paced that it, it was almost watching it uh, fully again last night. It's almost like unbelievable that they were able to fight at that pace for five or six rounds, however yeah, long it the, was. It was just like a. It was phenomenal, wasn't it? Because Fraser, he, on the official scorecard, according to Box he had uh, won the first fight over the 10 rounds, 99 and 91. So nine rounds still. So, I think that was a bit generous as well to me. I think mm. that was, uh, I'd have given him at least 
I think he got about seven, yeah. I think he was down by three, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the last round in particular. Uh, but once again, the referees swayed by the crowd and yeah. you know, that crowd was phenomenal. It really was, you know what I mean? But once again, he boxed well and he boxed at range and everything and all them things seemed to go out the window in the second yeah, one. Yeah, I was about to say, it seemed like any kind of split moments in the second fight where they were at range, he was kind of seeing everything and dominating those exchanges. But to be fair, fair play to Corey for forcing it on the inside and obviously yes. um, in, in the second round, because obviously he gets knocked down pretty much as the bell goes in the yeah. first round, like as a, a cornerman, I would imagine you're probably thinking of what you're going to say maybe 30, 45 seconds before like the round actually ends and I, that obviously completely changes that yeah. in the window because you're going to be more direct and focus on recovery and stuff like that as he beats the count and, and gets to the corner. Is it more to the point when something like that happens? Or the thing is for that, it's kind of almost like a flash knockdown. Yeah, it was kind of bump him. Yeah. yeah, and even he said himself, he goes, it just straight down, back up again. He was all right. And that's the first thing you say, are you okay? Yeah, if they start looking groggy or stuff like that, you call it off. Like I've had one guy down in Glasgow and he got punched and he comes to the corner and he's like, I can't see out this eye. <laughs> oh, that's it. You know what I mean? That's it done and dusted in my eyes. Uh, but as I said, for that, I just wanted him to get to his long game again. Yeah. And that's when you saw he then dropped Corey, dropped Corey right down after, yeah. with the long range stuff. But once again, you know, it's just like things going through the head and stuff like that. The fact that he'd been knocked down, some people have started rushing in and it did get, almost scrappy which suited Corey to a T didn't it you know what I mean do you think he felt do you think he maybe put a bit of pressure on himself to beat Corey more devastatingly in a, yeah. a rematch yeah. yeah yeah without doubt yeah and hopefully I said as you know yourself he's just been away across to uh, Mexico on a training yeah. camp he's now under Davey uh, McAllister uh, so he's like full time he's giving it so hopefully he can all these things I mean it's all step by step by step you know what I mean sometimes a loss can do well. We mentioned this earlier. Sometimes loss can do you a world of good. Yeah? I mean, and the only problem is in the amateurs, as I said before, records don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, if you look at Corey Rizzo, you look at his record, and he's like 50 50. And you go, oh, that's not bad, yeah. But he won the Britishes last year, yeah. beat a guy who was unbeaten, yeah, and absolutely schooled him. Yeah, the light was looking to get through. And I mean, uh, didn't do very well in the uh, opens this year, right? But then box the lad who beat him previously our home show and beat him I mean but if you look at his record you go how oh, good is he you know what I mean and there's quite a few they've got a girl all about the females yeah Faith you look at her record and she's only won one yeah but two the ones she's lost have been split decisions yeah one was at home show and even the referee came over and went ah oh, nah you know what yeah. I mean so but the problem, the problem with that is once you start getting a few losses you know what I mean Fraser's not too bad because Fraser's a popular guy and people want to watch him yeah. box, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's a nice lad as well, so people will pay for that. But once you start having a few, you know what I mean, are they really going to start wanting to go and watch you lose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I think he'll be all right. I think he's over there with McAllister, he'll be all right. You see, from us meeting him for like an hour, we were like completely shocked at how... Blown away, mate. Yeah, in Blown terms away. of, you know, he's still a very young guy, right? He's always yes, like yeah. 22, 23 years of yeah. age, but has seems like he has a very much... Mature mind and what his actual age is. He mm. was. I think we came away from that, and he says he's probably the most for this age, the most focused person we've ever met. Yeah. Um. He just. He was so determined. I think that was really, really yeah. determined. And it's, it's, it's so nice to see with that in someone so young. Um. And hopefully that kind of carrot trick sticks is going to push him all the way. You know, it's um, it's it's refreshing, yeah. definitely. Um. I'm gonna. <laughs> Pull you back. You mentioned it earlier on the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> um, if a MMA fighter came to you to coach them in boxing for an MMA fight, would you consider it, Ratch? We've actually had a few of the guys come over. Yeah. Uh, Martin's contacted me. Because uh, Martin used to box for us as well yeah. years ago. Uh, so he, he sent a lad over to do a bit of work and stuff like that, get some rounds in sparring. And, uh, cause they used to have a, a guy, Andy. He used to coach with us and then he yeah. well, he's actually in Australia now yeah Andy Hitchcock yeah, right. yeah, yeah yeah good lad uh, yeah I coached him in the RAF as well yeah. I, well, I've not mentioned I've been in the RAF did I <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, so they used to do stuff with Andy and they, they've come over I said Ginge was over last week so got no yeah. problems with that whatsoever yeah but they'd have to fit in what we're doing there'd be no like specialists as I said they'd be like yeah. come in join him with a class yeah and go uh no, yeah, I've got no problem at all. You know I mean? Do you enjoy this sport yourself, MMA? MMA, it's, 
Think about Doug Nevins, yeah. Doug Nevins is a, I'm friends with his dad, yeah, Stu, and uh, I saw this Doug years ago. I went, the thing I don't like is when somebody's out and they're still punching them on the floor. Mm, yeah. I went, that, it's just, you know what I mean? And he said, well, he said, they've had to do that, Ratch, because they've had guys where they've stopped and next minute they've got up and choked them out or don't that. He goes, so that's the reason why. But in boxing, once somebody gets a wallop, unless the referee's totally inept, which we've seen numerous times, mm it gets stopped, yeah? yeah? It's not like, let's wait till this guy's unconscious and then we'll stop it, you know what I mean? I know there is times that they do wave it off, but you just see the horrible ones, don't you, where people's heads yeah. bouncing off the yeah. canvas and they're still punching them. Uh, so for me, it's, it's not really my bag, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And I suppose in boxing as well, like, there's even fights where, and it kind of annoys me because you, you, you see like a big fight in a pub and there is like obviously the casual fan that, you know, want to see knockouts and things of, of that nature but like fights that get stopped on the ropes and stuff like that and people are complaining about it it's like I don't think they realise how stuff goes from zero to a hundred real quick in boxing right? Yeah, like, how bad it can go you know yeah. what I mean like a, one of the ones that I remember the most is uh, Chris Eubank Jr and it was um, was it Nick Blackwell he ended, yes. he, and yeah. he didn't even get dropped and then it was no. like he was in a coma the, the next day you yeah. know so um, things that people don't think about um, if you're, you know about that what's the Nigel Ben and McCallum Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was well, it was in the 90s yeah but that's one of those that Nigel Ben gets put through the ropes in the first round you go oh my god and then you see McCallum and you know what in the corner you mentioned about when Fraser came in what you're doing I mean you just check, check these guys are alright but he kept on like blinking and sticking yeah. his tongue out and all this stuff. and then later that, well, something happens he's in the wheelchair now you know what I mean but yeah. once again his corner wasn't doing his job properly mm -hmm. you know what I mean he wasn't looking after his boxer and at the end of the day that's your the priority of every coach is the welfare of the boxer, whether it'll be you pull them out too early. And I've had it before. I've thrown the towel in for somebody and they've come over and they've kicked off. I did it once uh, we're at RF show and the official uh, should remain nameless because he's a plonker. Uh, he came over and started going mad at me. Get that towel out. Blah, blah. I want you to throw the towel in. Your towel's in. You know what I mean? That's yeah. You, yeah. you know what I mean? In amateur boxing, especially in the pros, you see sometimes the referee will kick it out. Yeah. yeah? But you're retiring your boxer. Right, but what validated what I did was afterwards a lot of the boxers said if that was me I'd like you be in my corner because mm. that was the time to do it so you feel and there's other times you know, you're know, you thinking do I don't I and it's you know what I mean and you go mm, yeah I will and other yeah. times you go oh he's coming back again and you'd let it go again you know what I mean so there is, there's nothing harder than throwing that towel in but at times you know what I mean you want your boxers to be well you want them to come back again and you can go, right, this is what happened, mate, you know what I mean? Or oh, the guy was too much for you, right? My bad, I matched you with him. I thought it'd be better for you. And we just reset and go again, like, you know what I mean? Have you ever had a backlash from any of your own boxers for throwing in the towel? That lad that was all about, he was a, a rough guy, but oh, yeah, uh, yeah. for once or twice, the, I, I did it with Andrew Smart against Josh Taylor. Uh, and once again, he was a bit... I think he wants to go out on his shield. Yeah. You know I mean, because he's going against Josh Taylor, who was an Olympian at the time and all this. I think Andrew wants to go out there and go to the end, but Josh was just picking punches at yeah. will. Yeah. And it was only going to be a matter of time before one of them punches did some damage. Yeah. So I was like, there's no point. So Andrew was a bit upset, first of all, but once he came down, he then realised. You know I mean, so. I think fighters are always going to have that competitive nature. And, you know, got to be, yeah. That's where, like, obviously you come or the official comes in. Or it's it's mad that you say that the official was telling you to put the towel out. That seems like he's, he's the, the RAF official. Was, so oh, right, he's, okay. a, he's like he, he was like the guy in charge of boxing. Oh, yeah? right, okay. like, it wasn't the actual referee. The referee once he sees that he, he's yeah. happy. Yeah, mm -hmm. honest, the referee was about that close before he to come and stop it. Anyhow, I just got yeah. in there beforehand. Just what you were mentioning there in terms of kind of balancing the thoughts of should I throw the towel in or not, like, I think there's two sides to this, right? Because obviously you've got coach-athlete relationship, but with the people that you've been training for years, you're obviously going to have a close relationship with them as, like, friends as well, right? Yeah. So how how do you keep, like, a, a kind of level mind? Because obviously these are split-second decisions a lot yeah. of the time, right, mm -hmm. of... Uh, someone getting knocked down and being like mm, I don't want it to take damage but at the same time I've got to trust their ability for a little bit to defend or uh, ride a storm or whatever it may be how how do you kind of manage that as your, your corner and people it's, it's like you know when you see people go about put this hat on and put that hat on yeah it's exactly the same it's like obviously I've got my daughter at times in the corner yeah now I'll put my coach's hat on 
and I'm in there and I'm analysing what she's doing, what the other person's doing, what she needs to do, blah, blah. And you'll see at times, you know what I mean, if you've videos of me in the car, I'm giving Megan right row and blah, blah. And she seems to have took that on because I've seen her in the corner with some of the girls and she's giving them a row. Yeah? <laughs> uh, but when I'm not there, oh, I'm absolutely nightmare. So when she went to the games, I wasn't going to go, right, because that was her thing. She'd earned it. It's time for her to go and stuff like that. But my missus said, you'd just be a nightmare to live with. Yeah, it's good. So she actually booked us all to go over. So we're obviously watching it. Unfortunately, she got drawn against Murray Com, the world champion and seven times world champion and blah, 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 blah yeah. But, I mean, it's Murray Com the, on the build-up to the games, had put one of the girls who was actually in the games through the ropes with a punch. Yeah, I was like, oh my God, and Meg did well against her. You know what I mean? Mm. That granted, Murray come won. I'm not going to say, oh, it's a robbery or blah, blah, it wasn't, yeah. But to go in there with such a, a high level, it's like Elgin playing Man United, yeah. Yeah? and Elgin <laughs> coming away with a one all draw. You know what I mean? We'd be emphatic, won't Probably we? Probably going to be odds on that these days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, it's exactly like that. so uh, going back to your question, I, it's the same as me, Goldie, Meg. They're your friends in the corner. You know, I mean, you've known these kids for you know, some of the kids for years and stuff like that. You just put the professional hat on, yeah, and you just analyze it, do what you've been trained to do almost, yeah. And then, you know, what I mean, if you're thinking, nah, that's it, out they come, yeah. But sometimes you've got to give them that development, you know, yeah. I mean, you've got to get them. So, yeah, they've got to dig into the trenches, they've got to come out fighting, you know, what I mean, you know, I've, I've seen times where I'm going, right, just circle around, get away from the guy. Because you've lost, what's the point of taking? But there's no point throwing a towel in or calling it. Yeah, let them just move away, and you know they're not going to get their hand raised that time. But they've learned something from it. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, well, it kind of touches back what you say. You learn a lot from your defeats. Of course, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to kind but, it, of, but it's better winning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take us back to the the pro game a little bit. Not not necessarily the local pro game, but the bigger pro game. Mm -hmm. Um, who are your, some of your favourite boxers to watch right now, Ratch? Well, I just watched Nathaniel Collins uh, on, I think it was Friday night. Uh, I've been away with Nathaniel uh, to a couple of camps, yeah, uh, and even all those guys. Uh, it was kind of not always the, the best in the Scotland squad, yeah, but he, he gave 100%, and then next minute he just stopped his guy, I think it was in 23 seconds, defending his title, yeah. and that was really good. Uh, the, <laughs> the heavyweight side... It's kind of a bit watery in it, yeah, let's be honest yeah. now. Yeah, they don't want to face each other. Um, so on that side of things, it's not brilliant. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it, it, it's weird because... Is there like kind of particular division you like watching? Uh, no, I won't no. say there's like... I won't, I won't go, I swear to, and it's not because obviously our Meg Boxer, like the females I like watching because mm -hmm. it's so technical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so technical. The only thing I don't like about it is they're still doing two minute rounds. Yeah, yeah? which I can't. When they did the uh, pro training course, that got brought up, and they put it down saying it's because certain female boxers that are at the top of the tree. That's what they've always done, and they're calling the shots. I'm thinking I can't get over that because the as soon as you become open class, which means basically <laughs> when it goes, you go not to three. Uh, three to six that's like your novice levels then it goes from seven upwards and then when you start getting to around your 14, 15 you're then open class once you're an open class boxer yeah, you're doing three minute rounds whether you're male or female and even like our girl Faith uh, Ross if she uh, was in the Scotches she did three minute rounds right but then she's going to go back and box in the novices which is two minute rounds yeah. right? so if they can do the three minute rounds I can't see why the females can't and it Opens, it's a different it's a different level uh, it's like when you watch the kids boxing they're doing a minute round it's like brrr, break mm -hmm. brrr, break you know what I mean so it's hard to split where in the three minute rounds you've got then time to adapt yeah yeah. and I've spoken to a few of the boxers who prefer that because you may have a little bit of a bad run but then you can pick it up and come towards the end I mean you're going right yeah I've got this round you know what I mean you start you do start analysing some of them can do it really well yeah, other ones come out and go, oh, it's crap, man, it's crap, yeah, and you're like, no, no, you, you've got that, yeah. I never, I'll rephrase that, I never say to them, you've got that, yeah, because I made that mistake uh, before, and doing a show at Inch at Huntley, and the guy came over, he's like, what do you think, Ratch? I was like, oh, mate, without a doubt, yeah, you schooled him, 
and then the other guy got his hand raised. Mm. And you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Then he looks at you and you're going, so I, I never go, you've won this or you've not won this or whatever, unless they actually spark somebody. A few times Scott Edwards dropped people and then you come over and go, yeah, you've got that. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the programme, I think the... I mean, I'm, maybe you'll agree, maybe not. I think the lighter weight classes have actually had a really good year at making like yes. the big fights. Like we've had obviously Ryan Garcia, Tank Davis, uh, Terence Crawford just, yeah. just off the back of obliterating Errol Spence, right? Yeah. That had been talked yeah, about. I, for... I enjoy the whole Devin Haney stuff. Yeah. yeah that's that's kind of, I don't know. I just feel that there's a lot more action in it. I'm a bit like yeah. you. I, I'm, I'm tired of the heavyweight stuff. I'm just, I think it's got a bit boring over the last well, Did you watch the Anthony Joshua one? It was kind of... I, it's, um, it's int- uh, I don't know what's happened there. It's almost like he kind of changed the whole style after the Klitschko fight, which is obviously like one of the greatest heavyweight fights yeah. in, in, that I remember in my lifetime, at least anyway. But it's almost like the hesitancy kind of came in there and then the Ruiz knockout happened yeah. and then obviously he won it back and then obviously Usyk just kind of outclassed him both times, right? Yeah, but, really good. Um, yeah. I don't feel like a le- you know, they're meant to be setting up this Deontay Wilder fight, but... I don't think that oh, goes I, very well for him. No, do I? No, no, I think no. he'd be too scared. But going back to that, uh, the the good thing about amateur, you can bring back to amateur second, is it's like two people go in there, they're going to box each It's almost like gentleman sport or lady sport, or whatever. They go in there, they box each other. Afterwards, shake hands, hug, yeah, almost respect for each other, yeah. And whether they win or lose, I've very rarely seen two boxers after they box each other go at each other. Yeah. yeah? yeah. And then you watch the AJ one, uh, and I, was, I brought this up uh, to a few of the boxers. He knocked the guy out, yeah, before he even said to the guy, was all right, yeah, he so, got out. Yeah. And they said to him, high five to all his friends at the side of the ring. I'm like, that's not sportsmanship. That's mm. not, you just basically, no. and then with the Usyk, when he grabbed the microphone and he was messing around with the belts and you're going, yeah. and we've actually seen the real guy here now, yeah, mm. not the person who's been media trained and people are looking after him. Is he actually not the nice guy that you think, you know what I mean? Um, I've threw Wimbledon links after shave. I'm like, what was one now? <laughs> but you're just like, come on, man. You know what I mean? Whereas I say, in amateur, even people lose, yeah, shake hands, because it's not that guy's fault, it's somebody else who's judged it. I mean, shake hands, out you get, you go in your corner, have your little cry, have a little sulk, throw your trophy around, get back to it again. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I think it would be fair to say from the amateur of the pro game, the pro game comes with a lot more just red tape, obviously with like the promoters and stuff kind of getting involved more heavily. And you've seen it with like the stuff, like we mentioned with Fraser last time, the Connor Ben kind of debacle that happened of yeah. where they were just going to let the fight happen. And then uh, I think it was the British Boxing Board of Control decided Brought to pull drugs, it. Yeah. 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 And then Dill- well, Dillian White, who Joshua was meant to fight, he- this is the third time that he's, he's failed, failed for yeah. you know, yeah. and it's like yeah. no one ever seems to kind of get punished for this. Like type of stuff. All what just say was, was it under eggs? The he'd been eating. Yeah. I reckon he'd have to have like three hundred eggs a week or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? He'd be egg bound, wouldn't he? Yeah, <laughs> I think it was the same. It was Canelo and the the, the meat in Mexico. <laughs> That's well, it. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it allows so much steroids yeah. in it. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably why Fraser yeah. uh, Wilkinson went over there. Get drugs tested next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, is it is it frustrating as a coach to like see like. I don't want to just, just outright say corruption in boxing, but I think it's probably like the correct term sometimes, yeah. right? Not just yeah, with the drug side of things, but obviously mentioned with decisions yeah. where someone's clearly won and then they, they give it like one of the ones I remember off the top of my head is when Canelo and Triple G fought the first time. And my opinion, yeah. not as biased because I preferred Triple G over at the time, but I yeah. thought he won that first fight. Yeah. And then one of the judges has scored it like Canelo by 10 rounds where it, like, they're not even being subtle. <laughs> like, not exactly, you know? yeah. And you're just going, <sighs> but yeah, you're right. There's, I'm uh, reading the book at the moment called The Journeyman and every so often I'll, I'll say to my missus, get me this, order me this and blah, blah. And it's basically what it says on the, the book, right? It's about journeyman, different ones. Uh, and that's showing you like the ins and outs of it here where they'll get paid to basically do a move around because somebody's a big ticket seller uh, and now the home and the way corner. And so you get into the pro side I came in, I was totally very, very naive, very green with it, yeah. Still am now, and I've moved away from it. I've, yeah, but you don't realise about this home and away side, about the journeyman, and they've got a purpose, they've got a reason to be the journeyman, yeah. It's to basically bring your guy along. But some people have had journeymen, and they're now on 10, 15 bouts, you know what I mean? You're yeah. going, uh, when do you let them go? Exactly, yeah. 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 Well, flipping back to the amateur side again, uh, years ago when Peter Red had a boxing club, they had a lad, and in amateur boxing you can have a thing called exhibitions, and it doesn't really go on your card. So 
you could have had like four exhibitions, yeah. You box me and you go, how many bouts he had? Oh, he's had none. Yeah. He's had a couple of exhibitions. You go, oh, yeah, we'll let that go, yeah. But it's quite stringent. Well, it's got to be same weight, same age, blah, 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 yeah. Uh, but this one lad, he's boxing one of mine, uh, guys. We went there and they went, oh, they, he wants us an exhibition. And Donald Campbell, our official, looks at him and he's like, no, he's had nine exhibitions on the bounce. He's like, no, this is a bout. And Adam, no, no, he's like, no, he's having a bout. So actually, he added a bout, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my lad won, <laughs> luckily. Yeah. But yeah. it just because it's shown it's like that. It's, I mean, people try to get that. Sometimes you want the best for your lads, but you can't just carry them all the way yeah. through like that, can you? Like, I guess, protecting them. Is yeah, the pr right. it's protecting, but then you go say, well, what are they going to be like? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Uh, and let them go. Because I think the, the Tyson, well, Tyson Fury fight show, whatever you want to call it, that's coming up in October is an exhibition, right? So it's not going to be an official. No. Yeah. It's just, and it's just like when they start mentioning that, because they're not really that clear with the rule set either. And it's like, is there going to be knockdowns? Is there going to be a scoring and things? And they're not never really kind of. Did you watch the Mayweather one? I was actually quite impressed with Mayweather in yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's robbing banks, yeah. isn't he? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think it should have been like some like six rounds, and then he went, oh, we'll do two more. Yeah. So it's like, it's like a spare almost. I mean, I'll have another couple of rounds. You know what I mean? I'm feeling fresh. And he's like 50 odd as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but to be honest, like, looking, like, I, I was of the generation that was just kind of got into boxing when, like, Ricky Hatton fought him, yeah. right? So I was part of the delusion that, like, Ricky Hatton was going to beat him and, uh, and all I that. Know. Um, and I, I used to, from there on in, I used to, like, watch Floyd Mayweather fights to see him get beat, which he would never get never beat. Do, right? no, and no. I, looking back at it, it's genius in it because he knew that being a villain benefited him more than being like a hero i guess in a way right and um the best defensive boxer of all time right or the you know yeah. kind of gives me on to my next question who who do you think is the best boxer of all time Rach? we get many we've got everyone's got a different opinion yeah. on this. there's no right answer no there's no there's no right or wrong for somebody who took the amateur style across right richie woodall yeah uh okay. and we, we met him at uh, the glasgow games uh, i'd won tickets uh, from Scott Rail, I think it was. Yeah, then to the competition. My missus said, "Into this competition," uh, and into the competition. And then I was working at Baxter's at the time. Finished night shift. Phones ringing. I thought it was like cold calling. And eventually, after about fifteen rings, I was like, for God's sake, it went over. Like, what? Like, I went, Is that Mr. Gordon? And I'm just about to go. Shut up! Like that. And it was like, oh, congratulations, you've won the tickets. I was like, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh, right, okay. So we went down. Uh, took a group of the boxers down, right? Fraser, Andrew Smart were both there, yeah, uh, had a great time. But I saw uh, Richard Woodall, and <laughs> usual dad joke, I thought it'd be quite funny, he came over, I went, Richard, I said, I'd like you as a commentator, but the only thing is, whatever you've got to say, I've always said it five seconds beforehand, and he looks at me, oh, and walked away. Well, <laughs> 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 <Rich. laughs> you know. <laughs> but yeah, so going back to it, I like Richard Woodall as... Uh, and everybody says Ali, yeah, but you've got to look at some of the things that Ali did. You know what I mean? Also, the ring for five years and has come back and win it. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's, but Ricky Hatton, yeah, yeah. love watching Ricky Hatton. And, and same as like your Nigel Benz. Calzaghi. Calzaghi was one yeah, that was yeah. yeah, Joe yeah. Calzaghi, yeah. I've mentioned him before as one of the best boxers. And when you read his book as well, and it, it basically, when he's going for one of his titles, his hands went all knackered. Yeah, so it's a bit like old Meg with knackered hands. And his dad's like, oh, we'll just call the fight off, don't worry. We'll just call it off. And kept him training, training, training. And next to me, he's like, I'm feeling good. He's like, well, I was never going to call the fight off. <laughs> he was always going to box him. You know what I mean? And it's mad that they always try to, especially Joe Calzaghe, they always try and play him his like career down and his record yeah, down as being yeah. one of the greats. Like They always pull out stuff like Roy Jones was passed it, Bernard Hopkins was passed And it was like, well, there wasn't that much age difference between them at the time. And, you know... Uh, the Roy Jones one was amazing. He basically kind of Roy Jones, Roy Jones in the end, you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, if you look at the one with Jeff Lacey, mm. and yeah. that was, I mean, Jeff Lacey was meant to be like the the middleweight Mike Tyson, and he was going to come through and rip his spleen out and all this type of thing, yeah. And he just schooled him, absolutely schooled him. Do you want to talk about some of the upcoming fighters that are uh, from the club just now? I, I know Lee speaks very highly of uh, Corey because yeah, obviously he's well, trained at SPG. For he has trained well. at SPG and seen Corey down there, and he's just he's just really he's a good kid. First yes, of all, he's yeah. like he, 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 he's always got a smile on his face and that, and he seems to enjoy his training. That's I think that's massively important. That. 17, 18 year old that you're still enjoying it you know yeah. even though you're maybe looking to do more in it he he, always, he doesn't look like he's oh, having a shit time or nothing like that you yeah. know it's like um, 
You've also have Lucas coming through. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Fraser spoke quite highly of Lucas, and he's, you know, he's um, a big lad. We've had. I'm just going to rattle off some of the names: um, Aaron, Megan, Lucas, Fraser, yeah. Smarty, Corey. Um, there's another one that's escaping me just now. Um, a unique bunch. Um, yeah. Talented bunch of boxers. And we've got some, I say younger ones. I mean, we've got <coughs> Tyler Sked coming through at the moment, uh, Nathan Green, both them two really talented lads as well, yeah. Uh, especially using Tyler as an example, yeah. Tyler, uh, his first fight couldn't have gone any worse if, it tried, if we tried, yeah. Got put down. Uh, not, I won't say in a bad way, it was kind of like, all the nerves and everything built up on him and stuff like that. So he had to then come home and his mates are going, how'd you get on? all oh, lost, yeah? And I'll be honest now, from that to where he is now, it's just like phenomenal, his journey. And he's had some losses, don't get me wrong. He's had a few where it's been close, other ones where you're going, you should have done this, should have done that, yeah? But he was sparing on Saturday and actually used his the video of him on the group chat and I went, look what this kid did. This is what we're on about doing, another phase on top of what you're doing. So you go in, move out, come back in again. And I went, and he's been working on that and working on that, so it's good. And I said, we've got the twins here that come to the club, two little lads here, uh, Brody and Charlie, I can never tell the difference. One wears blue laces, so that's Brody, so that's easy enough. <laughs> uh, we've got all the females, we've got, uh, I've mentioned already, uh, a couple of them, we've got Josie, who won the novices. We've got Faith, who was very unlucky not to win the novices. Uh, or Megan mentioned, we've got some of the RAF girls that come through. Uh, yeah, Emma as well. Some real talent. It's, it's, a, it's a good club to be involved with, you know what I mean? And I said, it helps with uh, all the coaches that's there, all the officials, and nobody's paid. That's the other thing as well. Because a lot of people think, I mean, the club's doing well. You must be, it actually costs us to go and train people, you know what I mean? So I live in Rother, so it's a 20 mile round trip, doing that four days a week. Uh, we go down to competitions. Like granted, the club pays for it. you going down to competitions, yeah. Going to sparring, all this type of thing. So, you know what I mean, the, all the officials all put their bit. And it's same as like your judges as well. For me, I couldn't think of anything worse than being a judge or a, a referee, yeah. Because let's be honest now, if you're coaching, you're reaping some rewards. You're like, I showed him how to do that, or that worked well. Yeah. And, but also, you got the negative. If they do something bad, you're like. I should have showed them this, or I should have done that. So you you got a journey together. As you mentioned already, I've got Andrew Smart, Fraser, uh, uh, Fraser Edwards, that's another one I've mentioned him, or he'll start sulking here. Yeah? That's Megan's boyfriend. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, he's won numerous titles as well, but his problem is he's offshore, so he can only box half a year. Mm, right, okay. Yeah? So uh, you've got these, you can say, I've showed them all this, I've showed them all this. Yeah, but for an official, you're just scoring. You know what I mean, and credit to that to give up your weekends, your nights to do that, yeah, for the love of the sport. It's yeah. just a lot like, you know I mean, so uh, just before because I know we're about to hit the hour just now, I want yeah. to end on the uh, you getting the Unsung Hero Award. Yeah. Can you kind can, of walk can I, ask, this? can I ask my question? First? Yeah, 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 go for it, go for it. Right, I've got one one awkward question. Oh, God, here <laughs> we go, every time. Have you, <laughs> have you ever been knocked out by one of your boxers? It was close as a lad. He, I'm trying to think of his name, Elliot. Uh, I basically said to him, one, two, and he decided to throw a lead hook on the end of it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I weren't expecting it. Yeah. And he actually threw the lead hook and it made that hard. The meal that I went bloodshot, like it popped. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, I had that little bit of a dip and came back again. Yeah, and I was, I was like loaded the punch. I was like, no. One, he probably knocked me out after I hit him. Like, but I was like, <laughs> uh, but we had that. And then there was another time when we were down at the first club and one of the guys had been rushed in about and kind of panicked. So I was saying to him, I was like, right. I said, I'll tell you what, I've got somebody. I said, just rush me through as many punches as you can. Yeah, I had my hands up, took all these punches. And then I was like, I was like seeing stairs and everything. Yeah, and I got in my car, I'm thinking, I should be driving here. <laughs> so, <laughs> give me another 15 minutes. Got home and it was still the old, like, stairs there, a bit of concussion there. I was like, holy crap, like, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, and then there's an, it sounds like I get battered all the time. But a, <laughs> we're actually talking about this the other day. There's a lad, uh, Greg Kearney, and uh, he hit me with a body shot. Yeah, he missed the pad totally. And 
I've never been hit with a body shot like it in my life. And actually felt my insides moving. Yeah. And it was still moving. I couldn't get my breath. I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'm not apologizing. I'm not. <laughs> so I was, I was like losing my right. I'm like, I'm not saying you apologize. I'm, I'm like, but I was like, right, in a minute. In a minute. <laughs> you know when you get winded, you're trying to get your breath and all this. Like, yeah. So I'll answer your question. Yeah, numerous times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What, what do you prefer seeing as a coach? you prefer seeing a body shot, a good body shot or a good shot to the head? You know what? Sometimes good body shots, yeah. It can, that's what we try and get with Lucas now and we did with uh, Fraser and Smith. Smith could throw a good body shot as well, yeah. Uh, but I think when they, they first start and they're at not novice level, yeah, they go head hunting. Yeah. And it's like... Yeah. Mur, 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 it's mur, human mur. nature, yeah. isn't it? Mm. It is, yeah. So when they then start getting to a more confident level and they start throwing the body shots in, yeah, uh, you, you see, like the Chelly Dog, he's boxing on the Ricky Burns one. Yeah, he's really good at body shots and stuff like that. But I, I do like it. I like it. I think as well, especially with the three three minute rounds now. If you throw some body shots in that first round, you're going to pay the dividends mm -hmm. later on. Yeah. yeah, because it's going to take it out the guy and stuff like that. Um, and you do see that. You see towards the end. Uh, but yeah, a nice, well timed body shot is spot on. Like you know what I mean. So just before we go, I want to, can you talk us through the day? Did you have any idea that this was coming? Did you warned at all? Or is it just you coming to the club and the BBC are there? So what happened was, uh, I was doing my lad's house up for him. He, li he lives in Rothes as well, my son, yeah, Jacob. He was actually a tidy boxer that never boxed. Uh, he's kind of like my yeah. missus. He's more of the the laid back type approach yeah, where Meg's more fiery like me yeah but if you've seen Jacob on the pads and everything you go oh my god he's really good but just never mm. had that drive to do it so anyhow I was over his house uh, we're doing it all up and then Megan came over she went right just to let you know we've nominated you for the Unsung Hero Award I was like all right, okay, because the woman wants to speak to you in five minutes. So I was like, <laughs> right, so phone went, and he's like, hello there, congratulations. Uh, just to let you know, you've been shortlisted. Yeah, uh, for it, I was like, right, okay then. So she goes, uh, quick ins and outs. So I had a quick conversation on the phone. I'm not the best speaking on the phone, I'll be honest. Quick ins and out with her. And then next minute, uh, I got a phone call to say, right, you've been successful. Well, you was actually voted to be the unsung hero, blah, blah, blah. We want to come to the club. Can we come to your place of work? Which was quite awkward, because obviously I work for a distillery, so I had to yeah. have a with Shivers. I said, is it okay? So they went through their people, yeah. But they had me doing some things, like going over, see that meter over there, go over and pretend you're doing something to it. I went, I don't touch them. And if the, <laughs> Craig Hulley or some of the PLC guys see me there, they would be falling me up. What are you doing touching that? <laughs> like, Get off it. Yeah. So I had to pretend I was doing that and then going, right, this motor down there, you can pretend you're doing some checks. And I'm thinking, if people see me doing it, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> yeah. So they were videoing that. I think it's just to see, oh, look at him. He's got a normal nine to five job, yeah? And then he does this as well. Uh, and then went to the club and then they did the video in there and had to do some pads with some of the wee kids and stuff like that. So it was, a, the only problem with it was COVID was on. Yeah. yeah. So uh, my missus decided after about, I don't know, two weeks of deciding what dress to work. She decided which dress she was wearing. Yeah, we got all our stuff. Went down to St. Helens, where we were originally from, stayed with family. Uh, and then we're going to go into Liverpool to meet up with some people. And then I got a phone call uh, saying that it had been binned. Yeah, it was going to be online. So I was like, that's it. So we ended up then, uh, knocked her on the head, drove back up to Rothus, uh, got the laptop on. Yeah, so they had to have the camera on. Yeah. And then as a video in it, yeah, the screenshot they took of me, I don't know how they did it, but my head looks about 15 foot long. <laughs> it was just like an angle. Yeah. So you see, like there's Meg looking in, misses, and this big massive Max Headroom head. <laughs> I was like, for God's sake, right? And then it just went off. We kept on losing the link. So it was a it was fantastic. And it was, I mean, as I said before, it's for everybody at the club. Everybody's involved. Goldie, Jason, all the other coaches, it's for everybody that year. But I'm like the, the figure out of it that's the best way to describe it so it was given to me but it was for everybody else yeah that's the best way you know what i mean uh, and but, i think like the the great thing about it is it comes across immensely obviously you have done wonders for the likes of smarty and, and meg and fraser and all the the pro guys but it mentions a lot of people that might have confidence issues or uh, people that might have social issues such as tourette's and autism like you mentioned in the video and that and it's a really really well-knitted community and you can tell everyone's absolutely delighted to be there which is 
sometimes just as good as you know winning the pro titles for the, yep. the pro guys and stuff like that as well so I think it's awesome but thank you very much for coming on to do this yeah, really appreciate it. hour goes quick yeah. doesn't it so, it, it yeah. does yeah. 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 yeah once you get past the first because it's like when we start it's like this is going to feel like it's going to take long because there's like cameras and all that sort of thing but it just like yeah, that. over. To over. Be honest, if you get me talking about boxing and especially if we can throw the RF in it, I'll be yeah. for, you'd, you'd, you'd be doing like 17 hour podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, thanks again, Rach. No I appreciate problem, it, mate. Cheers, thank you.